Now, this Prime Minister of the Southern Cameroon, under the, uh, under the, using the two alternative, he had administrative, administrative authority, he had the develop, uh, the economic development in his own hands, and uh, of course, security in general uh, was going to be a matter for which could be discussed, you see, to make it um, both for the federal government or what we call concurrent. That is to say, I was, or the Prime Minister of the Southern Cameroon was going to be in charge of the police and uh, the, um, the army could be, um, could be national, territorial. We didn't think of the, uh, of the um, Yandam to be extended in the southern Cameroon for any reason. It was because when, um, when he, when the, there was no constitution that he managed to send the gendarme in the south in Cameroon and uh, gradually now posting all these, they are his obedient uh, um, troops, they are his obedient civil servants and they can do anything there, they are protected by him, so anything could happen. When did the gendarmes come into West Cameroon? Mm. Let's say as soon as the British troop left. You know, the British tr trained um, a mobile wing with not, ma not many at all. So the gendarme came to help the mobile wing and um, to, to, f to man some of the places. And when they came, the mobile wing was holding some part of the stations, and they were holding other parts. But they despised the mobile wing, while the mobile wing also despised them, because they had no, no, no form of uh, military, military maneuver as they. Most of the terrorists were were captured by the by the mobile wing, Southern Cameroon mobile wing. They combed the frontiers of the Mongo, Santa, and got brought out some of the uh, the terrorists who were ha ha happening there. And of course, it was the Nigeria um, from Nigeria. I mean, the Nigerian forces which which left Nigeria. General like General Tato and um, others who really did the coming of the frontier without killing. They didn't kill the they didn't kill the terrorists. They rounded them up, used them to find out where the others were, treated them well, and then bring peace. <coughs> <coughs> The southern Cam about computing. The southern Cameroon had no, no, nothing to administer with the taking over of the or with the dissolution of the House Nations National Assembly and the House of Chief and everything. There was no no authority in the southern Cameroon. That's what is called annexation. Annexation went much further that anything that existed in the southern Cameroon was not allowed to remain under that name. First, the Cameroon Bank, which had outgrown other banks in La Republic was the source of income 
by people from Douala, Kongsamba, and all these other places who want money for trading. Before that time, before 1970 something, <coughs> before 1970 something, no bank in La Republic could borrow money, uh, give a loan up to one million. If you want a loan up to uh, beyond the 500,000, you have to fly to France. Only France will approve it. But the Cameroon Bank had reason to loan money to, the, to, to five million. So traders in, the, in Douala and along the Mongo and furthermore were able to get enough loan. <coughs> and that was <coughs> not so good for Aijo. That was why then all everything the southern Cameroon must fall. We organized the development agency to give loans to farmers and so on to businessmen and the uh, Moso Nanga company was rising up to compete the other companies, the French company. <coughs> <coughs> and had, in fact, built the Prime Minister's, uh, Prime Minister's um, office in the Southern Cameroon, out of a mayor for the five million francs at that time. But that, a building like that could have cost the, could have cost no, more, no less than 150 million, but using the Ang English way of economy and way of organizing labor, Nanga company was able to do it for 45 million. That was a slap on the face of uh, um, the Republic of Cameroon. It was an indication that the British were going to abolish or more or less lessen the, the amount of bribes and the money they get from the you know, contracts. <coughs> and so everything was by not signing the, the draft constitution, everything fell in the hands of Aijo. The one of the the next project which we had was lottery. I sent a team to Israel to train for lottery. They came and established a, a rapidly growing uh, lottery. And we were getting the money now to build hospitals and clinics. Ahijo didn't want the people of his own section to, to patronize our lottery. I the Prime Minister, uh, Sally was a Prime Minister. I negotiated with him, but Aijo did not agree. That the people of the same country. Now, I said we were going to share the profits. Aijo did not agree. And then after 1970, then he transferred it, it became central. Now the, the Youth Day was formed on the Southern Cameroon to commemorate the independence for the Southern Cameroon, Independence Day, which was the plebiscite day. Because there was no other greater thing achieved in the Southern Cameroon than by voting so massively for independence and unification. The 11 February is a historic day for the Southern Cameroon, which should be commemorated. That was formed by me and by my government of the Southern Cameroon in 1964. Then, <coughs> 1968, well, the East Cameroon were imitating, want to imitate it. So Aijo thought 
it should be centralized. It should be made central. So he centralized it to be um, also practiced in all the in all parts of the federation. That was 1960, about 1968, four years after. <coughs> but he did not say that it was there. It was a new. It was started in 1968. He said. Imagine. I think which was being run in the Southern Cameroon since 1954. When he transferred it, he didn't mention the Southern Cameroon. It was originated in 1968 <laughs> or 1966. It might have been 1966 when he transferred it between, between these two dates. So uh, Cameroon, Southern Cameroon was tinning coffee. And this coffee was of standard to marry um, export exportation, and as much of a good part of it was being exported, in the name of label, in the name of Southern Cameroon CDC. T was the same. I hear you saw to it that the Santa Coffee Estate was abolished, and so there was no other uh, means of the Southern Cameroon. You see, running. Uh, getting its own in independent income. So all the income, we must look to Yaoundé as the only father of the Federation to do everything. And now, they, so this, the Prime Minister of the Southern Cameroon was going to be left with no duty. So he has to abolish it. And uh, in the practice of francophone and then not French, as we may say, if you are uh, assistant to any post in, in Yaoundé, you are just there either to get your money and do what the president say, or you might as well resign. Money to keep people in a Post was not their was not their difficult. It was obedient to, the, to their party and keep as a subordinate. And with 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 us, that was not possible. We were not running that much, so he had to get a new set of people. You see, who who had to tow his line of action. I found myself, you see incapable of doing things in a very awkward way, in obedience to the head of state. Because I insisted that anything that I do should reflect my own mentality. And all, everything that I did which was going to do that was abolished. I was charged with the president or national president or chairman of the higher national council for education and um, I held that post up till the time I left or before the time I left I had talked so much about technical education that uh, in the end um, a good subsidy from the United States President, I think President uh, Agnew, he gave ten million uh, dollars. That was a big sum of money at that time for technical education. And I told Aijo that I would like the Southern Cameroon to benefit from that ten million by raising the technical college of uh, Ombe to a higher technical college and institute um, as at the beginning one in Bamenda. But I used to spend all that money on his own side. Instead, I, mean, I never knew that he, that was his um, his, his ways of doing things. He said he, he, 
it is centralized about the downgraded the Ombe Trade, Trade Center Technical College to the grade of his own cap. All the heavy equipment left by the British were looted. Our, everything was run. And then he post, he transfer all the, um, the British trained teachers there. He transferred them to teach secondary school. Then I had sent to the state of Wisconsin uh, 12 teachers to study a few years for the industrial industry, um, subjects in both primary school and the new colleges which might be, be built. Then this finished their qualification and came, and came back about 1966. Not one of them was post, posted in Limbe. So they were made to teach English in other schools. And nothing was mentioned about technical education and so on. So the, the University of Cast Technical Unification, I mean, Technical University of Cast, which was to be built, which was one of those which was to be built alongside with the University of Yaoundé. We couldn't get teachers in those days, we couldn't get funds in those days. And the United, Nation, United States sponsored the Peace Corps and the principal who opened the pre-university of, of caste in the, in the form of high secondary school. It grew so rapidly and got the CDC at very good rate. Their um, successes in the GCE advance especially their scientific, scientific knowledge, you see, was high. Aijo and the rest, you see, detected that and started dwarfing them in the polytechnic of Yaoundé. So much that by 1985, the number of English um, students who left caste and entered very, very great difficulty. We're only ten. All those who were entered there found the condition either so bad that they managed to leave, or those who remained. Out of the whole time since '85, only ten out of 400 who have graduated in the Polytechnic School of Yaoundé. So I have noted that Aijo wanted to dwarf Southern Cameroon as far as, as far as techni School of Technology was concerned. And uh, later on, when he decided to decentralize the University of Yaoundé, he left the University of Caste not mentioned. He later on, proposed a university for Buya, and you know how long that took. He put the name after he had been approached, I've asked him, he proposed that one. Mm. Now he didn't want to do anything with Cass in order to keep the, the, uh, the, the Northwest and Southwest, you see, divided. So he proposed a university of, of um, a university with no anything, probably it was going to be a university of culture. He later on made it a translation bureau, as we call it. How could a, uni a whole university be for university, for translation? And so it, 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 was, it was built. Those buildings were with equipment, I mean, with no equipment, and with a number of teachers, what were they teaching? 
about less than a hundred students were there for the whole university. It was recently when Paul Bia found me trying to uh, raise um, so much objection for rejecting the sovereign, um, I mean the Cameroon, sovereign Cameroonian in the technical education, uh, technical university of um, Douala. When he started trying to allow very few to enter, very few, few English speaking Cameroonian to enter. Otherwise, they wanted to dwarf the southern Cameroon from any technical uh, rising. They had fine our scientific knowledge high, our secondary school organization high. They want to abolish the GCE in, in 85. When I stepped in and um, they brutalized our students, when I stepped in to quarrel with Paul Beer, they brutalized the students. I took them to task in the central committee meeting. And then the only person who could support me was the late, um, the late <coughs> Dr. Fon Long and uh, Professor Ngu. And they made it clear. And um, during that time too, after the brut uh, our students were brutalized, I summoned a meeting of uh, Endele, Muna, Egbe and myself to meet in Yaoundé, and then discuss the matter with the president. The day I arrived, I flew to Yaoundé. Mm, none of them appeared. They were still my opponent. I, and then they did not come. Mona did not come. And so that failed. And I wrote to Aijo, I mean, I wrote to Paul Beer, asking him, that he wants to discipline our sons and daughters out of our own intervention. I asked him whether he would be able to do that. And the security men said at that time that if the students demonstrate, we're going to shoot. I called the deputy minister in charge of Yanda Marina and asked, do they, do, do they not know that that was annoying? Whether when they shoot any student for demonstration, I will sit with them. Oh, they simply answered, well, it was a mere uh, threat to, to frighten them. So we don't frighten people by talking about shooting. I told him whether he had known that students in some part of the world burned themselves with petrol for protests and whether by that frightening the English people will stop um, bringing their voices to be heard.